As COVID-19 disrupts supply chains, is this Africa's chance to become a big player in the game of global production? This is the AFC Great Debate. Welcome to the AFC Great Debate. We're live from our special Great Debate studios. You can join in by typing your questions for the debaters into the chat box to the right of your screens. And please vote for the side you think makes the strongest case. They'll be debating a very hot topic. Global trade across the world is being severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's not just a China crisis, it's a chain reaction that's taking its toll on demand and supply chains across the globe. Factories are closing down, millions of jobs are being cut, and supply shortages and bottlenecks are strangling industries globally. As countries and companies reconsider their strong dependence on production from Asia, the perception is that African countries stand to gain as these companies aim to diversify. So the burning question is, can Africa seize this moment of the great global supply chain realignment to fill the gaps created by crisis in China and elsewhere? Or will existing challenges and barriers prevent the continent from seizing this window of opportunity? That's the topic for this debate, and we have two great teams of debaters. One of the teams, the for team, and the against team. So let's meet them. The captain of the team arguing for the motion is also the convener of the AFC Great Debate. He's here in the studio with us, Samaila Zubairo, president and CEO of Africa Finance Corporation. AFC, as it's usually known, is Africa's infrastructure solutions provider. The captain of the team against the motion joins us from his office at Oxford University. He's one of the biggest thinkers on African economies and the author of numerous books, including The Bottom Billion. Welcome, Professor Paul Collier. Vice captain of the team defending the motion is Oliver Andrews. He's the chief investment officer of Africa Finance Corporation. And Oliver's job at AFC is to deliver transformational projects that will position Africa in the next industrial revolution. Joining us from Accra, Ghana, is vice captain of the against team, Mr. Tutu Aguiari. Tutu is the managing partner and founder of Nubuke Investments, an asset management and advisory firm focused solely on Africa. The third debater for the team defending the motion is Jens Thomason. Jens is a partner at AP Moller Capital. That's an affiliate of AP Moller Holding. They invest in businesses that, quote, have a positive impact on society. And last but certainly not least is the final debater for the team attacking the motion, Carolina Dale Ditlev Simonson. She is a professor at the Department of Law and Governments, Governance at the BI Norwegian Business School in Oslo. So those are the great debaters, and this is the motion they'll be debating. This House believes that legacy trade practices and infrastructure bottlenecks are the biggest impediments for Africa to take advantage of the great global supply chain realignment. Now, I urge you to start voting. You can start voting now for which side you think is winning the argument by clicking on the poll button, button right here on the Hopin platform. You decide the winner. Now, this is an Oxford-style debate, so we begin with two-minute opening remarks, starting with Captain Samaila Zubairo for the team defending the motion. Sir. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you all for joining this debate. So Africa is uh, home to 30% of the world's minerals. Africa has the largest platinum deposit in the world, about 90%, gold about 40%, copper gold about 60%, 12% of the world's nat uh, petroleum, 8% of the world's natural gas, and I think 10% of the world's renewable water resources. Despite all of this, we are contributing only about 2% to world trade, 
and we have the lowest regional trade um, in, the, in the world because of our uh, infrastructure uh, deficit. Um, and we are really just price takers for most of the minerals and commodities that we have. So we are constantly vulnerable to volatility in the crude oil prices. So what we do at AFC is to try and focus on how we can get countries and societies to focus on value accretive beneficiation of their resources. And we have, uh, I'll give you two examples and give you uh, an example of what we have done in this regard. So if you take uh, cocoa, for example, cocoa, uh, Africa produces about 70% of the world's cocoa. We are currently contributing or benefiting just about 6% of the value created in a $100 billion uh, value chain. Likewise, Africa, uh, the cashew business has about $10 billion of value created globally. Uh, Africa produces 55% of the cashew and we are only able to capture about 10% of the value. Now, what we have done um, is to see how we can work with African states to change that. And we did that in Gabon. We worked with the government and our partners, Olam, uh, through our Arise Industrial Platform to increase the contribution of timber from uh, at about $350 of export to over a billion dollars of export. Uh, we've created 8,200 jobs uh, through that, and we created 26,000 jobs, uh, indirect jobs as well. So we think that there's significant opportunity to uh, focus on a creative beneficiation of African resources and create jobs, solve uh, poverty problems, also solve carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions by exporting and re-importing goods to the continent. Thank you for that opening two minutes, a strong opening two minutes from Samaila Zubairo, AFC president. Next, we hear the two-minute opening statement from the captain of the team against the motion, Professor Paul Collier. Well, thanks very much. First, we don't deny that there's an opportunity from the realignment. There's certainly an opportunity. Um, uh, nor do we deny that um, poor infrastructure and legacy trade issues matter. Right? But our team is the team that says but. Um, and um, partly, uh, I want to suggest that it's getting breaking into supply chains, global supply chains, is actually quite, a, quite hard. It's much harder than infrastructure. Um, Essentially, it's a coordination problem. Um, uh, a supply chain is a great cluster of interdependent firms. And so in breaking into it, um, really quite a lot of firms need to move into the same African country at once. That's a coordination problem. Firms themselves can't do that um, unless there's one big firm that drags in a lot of suppliers with it. Um, and the agency that's best equipped to coordinate a sort of mass move of a group of interdependent firms into the same place at the same time uh, is the development finance institutions. So, for example, in, in Norway, it's Norfund. Um, the development finance institutions could catalyze this move. Um, and there's another but, and that is that... Um, uh, fixating on breaking into new exports is a very limited way of looking at Africa's opportunities. Africa's got many opportunities for firms um, beyond just trying to export to the north. Um, uh, in fact, Africa's real problem is not low exports, it's low productivity across all sectors. And that's because it's desperately short of proper firms. Firms, no matter what the sector, bring workers together to work together. That's economies of scale. Um, they get workers to specialize in different things. Specialization and division of labor. The, 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 the seedbed of productivity change. Thank you, Paul. So Thank you for those. New firms in all sectors. And there's a huge okay. opportunity there. OK, thank you for those two minutes, Paul. Next, it's AFC's Oliver Andrews. Two minutes to make your opening remarks for the motion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
And my starting point would actually be where Paul stopped. Um, because um, in uh, 2018, he hosted, uh, if you remember, in Oxford, uh, um, a, a, a conference to look at fragile states. And he made the bold assertion in his paper that, in fact, what, we, what you wanted to do for those fragile states was to invite proper firms, as you call them, in fact, li with large-scale um, 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 investments so that can create the kind of millions of jobs that were needed. I wholeheartedly bought into that and support it. But then you go on to say this morning that you believe that should be led by the DFI, so that the DFI should do that. But really, inherently, the problem has been that the, ver the policies of the DFIs to date, actually, when you look at it, does not actually support that. They support the more micro elements of, of, of investments in these areas. And actually, that is the problem. So when I go to a place like Sierra Leone, and I say, well, you've got iron ore, and we should actually build a smelter, or we should do it on scale, the DFIs would rather we do a small scale Mm. agriculture for the low um, 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 to, to make sure that we had something that actually goes down to if you like the micro um, 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 and touch at those bases so there has to be a fundamental shift if Africa has got to seize upon this opportunity to the large-scale proper investments and that's what we are trying to do and are promoting because right now the investment should go to those areas to beneficiate large-scale our raw materials and to beneficiate even our agricultural products to have added value to them. One thing I will also say, it, it's also, Paul, when you say the global logistics chain, the, the way it is structured today, the international trade practices largely, and you know, I'm, we're not going to change them by policy di dictates. It's going to be by a recognition that inherently built into those trade practices it's a bias against the, the, the developing countries. Let me give you an example. Oh, wait, you can't give them an example. You have to hold that example for the debate because you're out of two minutes. I, I should have warned you also that Oliver is also a pastor, so he also has uh, <laughs> a, a distinct <laughs> advantage in this uh, debate. Now I turn to Tutu Aguiari in Accra. Tutu, you have two minutes to start your case against the motion. And, and what I would like to say here is that I think that whilst that mention has been made of DFIs and to pick up on the point just made earlier. I do think that policies um, are in the process of being changed. I think that one of the areas, um, and one thing mentioned earlier was the fact that, you know, the policies don't, uh, are biased against the African or developing countries. I mean, I think it's incredibly important for a start that going through these WTO, head of the WTO negotiations, that, you know, we have two African candidates going forward. I'd love to see the Africans get behind one candidate because somebody at the helm of trade policy is more likely to be able to reshape things appropriately so that the balance exists. You know, I sit in, in Ghana at the moment. I spend half my time between here uh, and, and Accra, and there is a significant amount of effort going on um, to significantly increase the funding to certain companies in key areas like pharmaceuticals um, to be able to beneficiate um, significantly more of the assets and start to exporting first to the sub-region and elsewhere. You know, in addition to that, you know, we are in the process of um, developing our bauxite industry. And interestingly, when, when that went to Parliament, um, Parliament was very robust about beneficiation. And actually, um, after a fixed period of time, the only thing they can export is processed product rather than raw product. So I do think that um, whilst there might be a, a sense of negativity around the inability of infrastructure and trade um, to, to keep us where we are, I think that progressive countries with the right policies are making significant changes. And that then presents an opportunity for international companies to come down um, into places like this and start to do their manufacturing here. You know, if you look at the current environment that we're in, um, Africa, and, and still boggles my mind that nobody seems to quite realize that Africa, regardless of all the doom and gloom, has come out of this particular crisis incredibly well. Yeah, yeah. So if I was re rethinking my global supply chain, I'd be thinking about putting more factories in Africa because it's a much better place and a much safer place and a much healthier place to, 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 to produce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful opening salvos there. Now let's hear from Jens Thomason for the opposing team. Jens, you also have two minutes to defend the motion. Thank you. Um, 
I thought I'd pick up on some of the points that we made earlier on. So, so Samila's example of cocoa is is is, uh, is quite pertinent, and uh, I think the same principle applies to raw cotton and cashews. And if you just sort of double click on 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 the cocoa industry, as, as Samila mentioned, um, in Ghana, uh, Ivory Coast produces about seventy percent of the world's cotton. Sorry, uh, cocoa production, but um, it doesn't get beneficiated. And I think you then sort of Look at what, uh, at the chocolate industry. I mean, Belgian chocolate is an oxymoron. The last time I checked, the uh, cocoa harvest in Antwerp was fairly abysmal. But um, Ivory Coast Ghana is forced to export its cocoa beans because they don't attract an EU tariff. Whereas, if you import beneficiated cocoa products, that attracts an up to an eighteen percent import tariff from the European Union, which allegedly is trying to support growth in Africa. So, I think there is a lot of work to be done on the to facilitate uh, export of beneficiated products. On the infrastructure side, um, th there is a lot of work to be done. My former colleagues, um, when they were at MERS, built a $1.2 billion deep sea container port in Tema, just outside of Accra, which I believe is the largest deep sea port in West Africa. However, uh, one of the projects we're trying to work on uh, ourselves is to improve and upgrade the connecting road that takes that port into the highway. And that is a road full of potholes and, and it's, it's in dire need of work. So, so I think thinking uh, very much of what I think AFC is trying to, to work, think about economic ecosystems, interdependencies, where we can start to create economically reliable counterparties because we don't have government balance sheets we can draw upon. Uh, governments in Africa are raising debt at eight, nine, 10, 12% when OECD countries are getting paid money to put uh, to, to take money off uh, other people's hands. So I think that um, disalignment there is perpetuating the challenges of building infrastructure and also imp impeding perhaps uh, some of these difficult trade conversations where we are going to put jobs at risk in Europe if we want to liberalize trade and allow Africa to compete on a level play playing field. Thank Thanks, you. Jens. Uh, let's now go to the final opening statement from Professor Ditlev Simonson. Carolina, two minutes, please. Well, thank you. This gentleman has said the, almost everything. So I, uh, uh, in this field, so maybe I should back and relax. No, I'm going to talk from uh, or address a different perspective. The motion is about increasing Africa's way of uh, increasing production export. Uh, but has everybody agreed that that is actually the goal? What happened to the sustainability goals, the SDGs? Uh, adopted by 193 countries, yet we are not addressing those at all. Can we assume that everybody wants to live like people in the developed world? Spending most of the time working in office or commuting in a traffic jam? Not sure about that. If everybody consumed as much as an average Norwegian, we would need five planets. Will African or people in general become more happy with increased production and consumption? He, no, because in Norway, for example, consumption has quadrupled since 1980. However, people's level of happiness has been pretty, pretty constant. Uh, and many Norwegians miss the close, uh, closeness of family and friends. And, uh, and uh, I see that that's really important and works very well in Tanzania when I work there. So we can learn a lot from Africa in the, that sense. Still, Africa has uh, has malnutrition and hunger, and that has to we have to get rid of that. And uh, the developed world also needs to get rid of obesity and excessive consumption. Fantastic! You've heard the opening salvos, and and let's go now to open warfare, the debate segment. This is a chance for each side to strengthen their case and weaken the oppositions. Uh, let's start with AFC's president Samila Zubairo, who, who is for the motion. Samila. You heard some interesting, I've got the poll results, by the way. I'm going to tell you that in a minute. They're coming in. So we, we I mean, lots of uh, points to follow up from, from uh, especially from, the, from Professor Paul uh, and uh, from Caroline Jens and uh, Tutu. So very quickly, you know, um, he talked about having the firms. So at the special economic zone we built in Gabon, there are 70 firms that are operating in that place. And they're from all over the world. You know, uh, and they're there because of the ecosystem that we've created there. You know, it's possible to do many things. So, for example, before, if you were just going to produce tables, you needed the, the wood 
in, in, in blocks. And you couldn't do anything with the cutouts and the waste. But the waste could be used to create knives. They could be used to create coasters. They could be used to create several other things. You know, at that same uh, uh, economic zone, an industrial park, you have people that make glue, people that make, uh, uh, that you need to put the, the saw wood together. So Gabon has actually grown to be the second largest exporter of vinea in the world presently. They are, I think, the eighth largest exporter of plywood. So this is practical example. This is not just a theoretical thing. You know, and right now we're actually thinking about having showrooms you know, in London here, um, in Shanghai, in San Francisco, uh, in, uh, in Osaka, you know, and whereby we put on display the, the furniture that is made out of this special economic zone. We have actually pivoted from there. We are looking at projects in Benin and Togo where we are going to focus on cashew and cotton. And we are going to try and also increase the value capture from Africa um, in these products. And we think this will solve some of Africa's key challenges. So one of the biggest problems we have is jobs. We have 1.2 billion people, over 60% are under 25 years old and they have no jobs. I think we have about 35, 37% unemployment on the continent. So these projects, this investment would actually create those jobs. So we think that now is the time for Africa to focus on industrialization, import substitution. And then of course, it's not, it can't all be about export. So we can consume the things here. So nothing stops us from eating our cashew, nothing stops us from eating our chocolates, nothing stops us from drinking our, 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 our cocoa drinks. We can consume here and we can create the base for the continental free trade agreement that is coming on stream. So with this production, we would feed that market. And your passion and conviction seems to be permeating into the uh, pollsters because I'm looking as the polls, poll is going and currently you're leading 75% 75, 75 for the motion and 25% against the motion. I'm going to go to the captain against the motion for your right to reply, Paul Collier. You have the floor. Thanks very much. Well, let's move that 25% up. So um, uh, the continental free trade area does matter. That's important because Africa is so... Present trade policies um, reduce the size of domestic markets um, to much too small a level. So we need something that's closer to pan-African. So that's very important. But think what opportunities that would open up, um, which are basically not necessarily export increasing to the north, but their production increasing in Africa. So food, at the moment, not only does Africa import a lot of food, it has something like 40% losses between harvest and mouth. And that's because there's just not enough food processing in Africa. Agro-processing of food means that it, it becomes, it lasts longer. And so that's a huge opportunity. Um, half of all expenditure in most households is on food. So huge opportunity to process it. That would actually reduce imports. And so it's trade reducing, but it's living standard increasing. The same and um, housing. Africans are very badly housed at the moment. There's a huge opportunity for job generation by constructing um, low cost, affordable housing. Um, that doesn't increase international trade, but it massively increases living standards. So these are the sort of opportunities we need uh, in Africa. And that's what um, firms know how to do. They know, they know how to organize um, food processing, they organize, know how to organize um, uh, affordable housing construction. So these are the opportunities as well as fixating on exports. Well, you'll be pleased to know that in the studio here, I saw your opposition nodding in agreement. So I think maybe you have moved that down. Oliver Andrews, what were you thinking? Well, I was, I was, I was nodding in agreement because yet again, I agree with Paul. <laughs> I, I agree with him. And, and for me, the two things you said, because it all ties up to what I call import substitution. Um, Africa still is importing far too much food when in fact they've got, they can grow the food. What is lacking is the processing. But there are two reasons why that I think is happening. We can't attract those firms to do that. First is the lack of infrastructure and, and central to all of that is power. We have still not got it right. And I'll come to the power in a bit. The other thing I, I must say is policy issues in terms of government making it e ease of doing business for these firms. We cannot leave here without actually saying also that governments in Africa must continue to look at the environment in which businesses operate and help them facilitate that. That is critical. And you hear this mantra 
about how they support the private sector and private sector being the engine of growth. Every African civil servant knows that, but the mm. fact of the matter is it's not practiced. Mm. And we have to be honest about it. Mm. Having said that, I also think, Okja, and there's one point I was going to come back to. The, the world trade as we do it today is disadvantageous. And Paul, I'm not so sure, sure whether you, you or any of your students have done something called, looked into what is called the incidence of transportation costs. Because if you look at it in terms of world trade, you will see that because Africa exports primary products all the time, we actually pay for the cost of that transport because it's largely FOB. And yet when we import our ambulances, our other critical aspects is on a CIF CS, basis. So in effect, when you look at Africa today, we are supporting and not just Africa, we're not for countries that actually, we're supporting world trade mm. because we're paying mm. both for the exports and imports of trade. If we had a fairer trade system, that would go away. Mm. Imagine the savings for African countries. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's some questions coming in for the, uh, for the debaters now thick and fast and the post is, is, is really coming alive. I want to read this question here and maybe uh, Carolina you may want to wade in. It says across the world climate change has been consistently ranked as, as the biggest threat to national security in several countries. Despite having the lowest emissions of carbon dioxide, Africa is the continent that's most susceptible to the impacts of climate change. By, tr but by trying to attain climate climate goals, will Africa miss out on expanding trade to fill this so-called supply gaps? That's the question. Want to tackle that, Carolina? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, increased production will definitely increase the emissions. And like you say, it's more impact in, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, but that has to do with consumption in, uh, in the rest of the world as well. But I think um, uh, the, one of the main problems is that the, there's poor, the pr production in Africa is, is poor. It's less expensive for African countries to import goods that they can produce themselves, sugar, coffee, cashew nuts, as mentioned here. And I'm also worried that uh, we're talking about supply, supply chain shift from China uh, to Africa, but what will happen uh, to a large extent is that Chinese companies buy up uh, African companies. And so it's like Chinese uh, companies exploiting Africa's resources anyway, even though it's coming from Africa. So there's definitely a need for business education in, in Africa. And I think that uh, that's what we're working on. Okay, I'm gonna go now to Tutu Aguiari. Thanks, uh, Carolina. Let's move to T Tutu Aguiari, please, to strengthen your case. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Yes, I mean, I... <clears throat> I actually do believe that the, that the realignment of the supply chain presents quite a lot of opportunities um, for Africa. I mean, most of our policies are aligned to doing one thing and one thing only, which is bringing foreign investors in or foreign capital in to either just come and take the raw resources or, or to potentially beneficiate. You know, I, I, I've seen a number of people who complain all the time because they chair local companies and when they compete in the same space with foreign companies, there are all these benefits that accrue to the foreigners, which means that they can never make the same amount of money. So, so policy changes and the realignment of policies, I think, are incredibly important. And, and the other thing, the other great travesty which exists, which I know is being worked on at the moment with a number of, of, um, of African institutions, is just the cost of capital. The cost of capital is nowhere near reflective of the risk. You know, three, four, five years ago, Argentina goes out and borrows you know, a hundred, you know, hundred year borrows money for a hundred years at six and three quarters percent, and then proceeds to go bust again for the sixth time in thirty years. And yet, you won't get an African non-francophone country able to do the same thing. Um, you know, Greece, which we all know nearly went bust a few years ago, you know, is borrowing money at close to zero percent. So there is, you know, there's this e economic arbitrage that exists where you know an extraordinary amount of pressure is put on, or extraordinary amount of cost is put on. On significantly lower risk African uh, in investments, and 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 that actually deters from this. But I know that there is a lot of work afoot pointing this out into national community so that this can change. Because I do believe that the realignment of the global supply chain, which means that if our real focus is actually on funding or, or, or supplying the needs of the other African countries, you know, processing food to sell, you know, in the continent, shorter supply chains, um, and refusing to allow raw materials. I mean, if I had my way, I, I wouldn't allow any raw cocoa to be exported out of Ghana and Ivory Coast. You know, if you want to, if you want our cocoa, come and process it here. You know, those are the sort of things which I think you very soon will start to happen. 
my final point on climate change is, is, is that I, I, I still struggle with, you know, Africa having a, a 2% of being 2% of the global population, and yet being asked to, to take the same pain as the rest of the world, mm. who polluted the world. Mm. And there doesn't seem to be an appropriate balance, you know, two of the, you know, two of the largest countries in the world contribute half to half of global warming. And yet, we're being asked to carry the same burden as anybody else. And that just seems unfair. And hopefully, mm. with the right person in place and some of these trade organizations, we'll start to see a significant change in addressing the balance around how this, um, uh, this pain should be taken. Yeah, this, this, you've, you make a lot of great points, but let me just touch on that one about the cost of capital. Uh, I have the, 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 the advantage of, of, of engaging the likes of the Subairo, Zubairos of the world and the Professor Benedict Orama of Afrexin Bank regularly, and it's a chorus. Yes. It's a chorus that all of you guys are in harmony about the cost of capital and the unfair advantages other, other, others have. I know you want to get in on that, please. Some, some <laughs> it's, his favorite topic. it's his favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just couldn't agree more with uh, Tutu. You know, um, and you know, the evidence doesn't support the risk perception of the continent. You know, earlier this morning, I was discussing on a, on a panel. I was saying to them that um, the, the default rate risk for Africa is lower than Eastern Europe, Oceania, mm. North America, mm. Latin America, and, and, and Asia. Mm. Yet, you know, um, we, we don't see that in the pricing of uh, African instruments. Why? Two reasons. Um, I think just the lack of knowledge, you know, uh, about the real risk A of the continent. A disconnect, really. Yes. Yeah. And also, um, the lack of uh, allocation. You know, the allocation for, for Africa is almost negligible. You know, and so you can't go beyond a certain pool. You know, so most investors would have allocation for investment grade. You know, and then if you're investment grade, you fall into that. And then they have allocation for frontier markets. Uh, and then all the African countries will fall into that frontier market. You know, and there you have all the other countries where people have uh, been able to better market themselves mm. and better connect with the investment community. So they, they have uh, better, better so, deals. So I hear that you're saying African investment opportunities or Af African, uh, uh, Africa is not very good at clearly marketing itself. Yes, we have not issue. changed our narrative. Yeah, it's poor. The, the narrative on yeah. Africa is, is war and famine. Mm. You know, we, we need to change that narrative. Yeah, urgently. We, yes, we, we have to. Especially and, and if there's an opportunity to take advantage of changes that are happening now. Exactly. Yeah. Which is why for us, we can't overemphasize the need to move up the value mm. chain. Mm. You know, it's not enough to continue to export raw cocoa, raw cashew, raw manganese. You know, just to give you an example, and related to climate. So you produce manganese from Africa, mm -hmm. you export it 3,000 miles to China, China mm -hmm. and you put it on rail for another 400 miles to a factory for processing. That voyage has greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide emission. When it gets to China, it's going to be processed in a coal-fired plant, and then it will be exported back as alloys or aluminiums into Africa. Mm. So think of all the greenhouse gas emissions in that voyage. If you produce or process that manganese in Africa, you create at least 400 jobs, at mm. least for a small plant. You would use renewable energy mm. from hydro, wind, or solar to do that processing. Then if you have to export the processing, you have far less voyages than you would if you're exporting the raw commodity. So it makes sense for us to change the way we trade with the world, mm. and now is the time to do so. I also don't agree that Africa, you know, um, should do nothing, you know, uh, and because um, Norway, Norway has increased consumption and they're not happy. Let us at least have the jobs, you know, and be unhappy than not have the jobs and wallow in poverty. Mm. You also need to understand that because you don't have jobs in Africa, people are constantly seeking opportunities to travel to Europe and the rest of the world, yeah. where they caused a migration crisis. Yes. So it makes sense for us to look at how do we keep Africans in Africa, create jobs in Africa. I think it's important that we do that. Mm. And now you're talking about disconnect, but one of the connections is with uh, Jens and AP Moller. He's not only your third member of your debating team, He's also, you also have a very strong business relationship. So perception or, or like his perception is very positive. So I'm going to go to Jens, Jens now to respond to some of the things that you've heard and maybe buttress your case, Jens. 
Yeah, we can go on for a long time. There's a lot of good stuff to talk about here. But but um, but I think um, if I'm sort of try to bring a constructive example to illustrate some of the challenges. So being Norwegian and, and uh, working in Africa for the last 10 years obviously brings memories back to the Norwegian aluminum industry, which was basically a premise upon uh, cheap access to power. And, and I mean, this was a, a material source of wealth generation for Norway before we had oil and Norway pre-oil was not a rich country. But that bauxite was basically probably dug up in Mozambique or, or in Africa, put on an HFO producing ship, hopefully it was not coal, and shipped up to the fjords of Norway where it um, ran through a, through a smelter and then being shipped back to Germany. Again, it's the same example that, uh, that uh, Samala made earlier on. If we, if we were to sort of think, how can we do this in Africa in, in, a, in a positive way? I mean, Mozambique has bauxite, Mozambique has Cahorabasa. Now, cost of capital is expensive in, in Africa, and we, we have an, a job to do as all investors to convey the good stores. I think the default rates of African uh, project finance deals are about 3% at least two years ago. US power is three times that rate. So the I think the perception belies realities to, to Samara's point. But renewable energy has um, come to Africa in a big way. And I think the programs in South Africa, uh, Morocco and Egypt has been a tremendous success, delivering very cost effective power. And the immediate response you get from the old utility school is, well, it's intermittent power. Yes, but um, there are, uh, it can be blended in very well with hydropower, which is developed to, to some extent in Africa. And if we can build, utilize the Kahora Basses or the uh, hydro projects that are now in development in Gabon or, or in Ghana to work in tandem with very cost effective wind and solar projects, then we can bring that low cost of power which can make manufacturing industry competitive, particularly when it is energy intensive industry. Uh, the manganese that uh, the Samaila uh, mentioned uh, in, in Gabon, and we're, we're a partner together with Olam and, and AFC in, in the port infrastructure there. This is the most uh, lowest cost manganese you can find in the world, but it's being shipped, put on a rail, put on a ship and sailed around to the other part of the world because that's where they have the smelting plants. And I think that's that is a tremendous opportunity can be dealt with. And again, dealing with the concern around offtaker credits, because we're working with industrials, commercial players like you do in other countries, we don't rely on government credit support, which is another bottleneck we're we're facing with. Okay, Jens, I want to now go to back to the questions. And one of the questions that we came that came in came for uh, Professor Paul Collier. Uh, Paul. Um, it says, manufacturing and industrial development will be central to Africa's ability to meet its development goals. Many African countries, especially resource-rich states, suffer the resource curse and are, struck in, st are stuck in a perpetual cycle of exporting unbeneficiated commodities. Do you think, Paul Collier, that this model is sustainable for Africa's growth as we build back better from COVID-19? Okay, so two things. One is the, the resource curse um, doesn't have to be a curse at all. It can be a resource opportunity. Um, but the key thing there is using the revenue, first capturing the revenues, mm. which is a lot about tax, and secondly, saving those revenues and investing them um, uh, in a range of things, including infrastructure. Right? And um, uh, some countries have done that, Botswana, um, and some haven't. So Botswana used to be about the poorest country in Africa, um, landlocked, semi-arid. It's now about the richest, um, and it got rich by natural resources, by diamonds. But it saved the diamonds, saved and invested. It behaved prudently. Um, a lot of other, other countries behave very foolishly, um, short-sightedly. Um, so partly, um, it's not natural resources that are a problem. It's the policies around them. Um, I wanted to also, jobs in a, an economy, Africa desperately, desperately needs jobs, right? Only a tiny proportion of those will come from manufacturing. Just look at any economy, right? Um, manufacturing is, is, is a small percentage of the jobs that people do. Most jobs nowadays are in the service sector um, or, or in construction or agriculture. Um, and so um, we've got to think more broadly than just obsessing about manufacturing. 
manufacturing matters, um, but we can do so much more, um, including we can do energy. So let me just close with a few remarks about energy. Um, uh, Ethiopia um, has created a lot of very cheap energy from hydro, and it goes back to the problem of risk there, because in order to finance that, um, since the NGOs blocked the, the aid agencies from financing dams for their own crazy reasons, um, Ethiopia had to go to China. And China um, uh, had opaque and very expensive terms for the money that it lent. Um, so we desperately need um, the, um, the European and American um, uh, capital to provide competition for that a very, very unreasonable uh, Chinese money. Um, uh, and, and secondly, uh, also on energy, solar. Um, solar presents big opportunities now um, that are, uh, and um, they're very well suited for Africa. Um, mini grids uh, based on solar um, are um, much less precarious than the big, big uh, power station. Okay, Professor, and, I'm going to, I'm gonna, and I'm going to have to cut you off there because we're, we're, uh, we have to stay to time, and we're close to finding out who has won the AFC Great Debate. Some powerful arguments here. Now, each of you has one last chance to make your case. You have one minute for your closing arguments. I will again start with Team Captain Samaila. So, thank you um, for us at AFC. Uh, we were built to. Um, provide pragmatic solutions to Africa's infrastructure and industrialization challenges. Uh, and we continue to find opportunities to do that. We have identified our uh, successful case studies. We also have a pipeline of industries and projects that we would um, invest in to grow this initiative. So uh, just touching on the last point made by Professor uh, Paul, you know, so you, you need manufacturing to create the services. The services don't exist in a vacuum. You need to create cornerstones, uh, industries, activities and initiatives, and the services will be built around them. So you need to have an anchor. And for us, job creation around beneficiation of our natural resources, uh, processing of our commodities, will provide that anchor for the installation and all the service industries and several other uh, things that can happen. So for example, if you can show that you've de-risked uh, a sector, you will be able to get several people that come into that ecosystem of that sector. Okay, I'm now going to the team captain for the team against the motion, Paul Collier. One minute. Thanks. So, breaking into manufacturing is hard and it doesn't actually generate an awful lot of jobs. Um, it's worth doing building these clusters, but it's not the make or break solution. India has created millions upon millions of jobs, but it's not really broken into manufacturing significantly. What India's done is services. Um, and these things don't have to be exported. Just focus on more on uh, the, the, the sub-regional economies within Africa, those markets. If we could join up those markets so that the domestic markets in Africa were not so tiny, single national markets, but with sub-regional markets, huge opportunities for firms of all types, both domestic firms and foreign. And actually there isn't a trade-off between them. It turns out domestic firms and foreign firms usually complement each other. Oliver Andrews, right to reply, one minute. Thank you. I am trying to bring this together now in terms of this post-COVID world that we're going to live in for Africa. And I'm, I want to touch upon something that Caroline said about it because we're not mentioned too much the environment. One thing we know we will never do as a world again, I hope, if we, the kind of species I think human beings are, we should learn from this experience and make sure Mother Earth, we give Mother Earth more respect uh, in the environment we live in. Now to do that, I actually say our trade patterns and policies, it's, it needs to change in a manner that we've talked about today, realign our logistics chain so that I can take uh, uh, iron ore from West Africa and bring to the Port Talbot steel plant that I know is in dire need of it, uh, rather than it being sent to China first before it comes to Port Talbot. And so we call carbon. I also want, in, I, am, I must go again to this happiness issue. Honestly, if you look at the misery, I only have to leave 
10, 5 kilometers. In fact, sometimes I don't even have to leave a, a metropolis in Africa. And you see the misery of how Africans live. Yes. The priority is jobs. Mm. We must offer them jobs. Mm. Now, be jobs in manufacturing, Paul has said. Uh, Samaila has said, Paul is saying it's not too much. I actually look at all of those, particularly what I call the sunrise industries. Mm. We need to look at that and how Africa can gain from that. What do I mean by that? Data. For example, Paul, mm. um, and what can we do for, to more, have more data centers to, to actually have, you talk about jobs in, 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 okay. in India, call centers are a big one if you, if, if you go down that road as well. Okay, Tutu Agyari will now try to sway you into voting against the motion with his one minute closing argument. Hi, um, for me, I think that this realignment of the supply chain is presenting quite a large opportunity. I think that in order to take advantage of the certain things that are happening, I think that addressing the issues around cost of capital is something that the African focus institutions need to come together, provide solutions on. And I, I know that you know my finance minister and, and the ECA and others are working very closely to hopefully arrive at solutions on that. And then secondly, the realignment of this global supply chain, I just, you know, I think that the opportunities that exist and the low hanging fruit exist with servicing ourselves, you know. Yes. The U.S. economy is 80 percent domestic. You know, Africa is 16 percent domestic. And I actually do believe that our realignment, you know, our, our focus should not be on trying to realign ourselves to serve the rest of the world better. The realignment should be much more and is should be much more on serving ourselves better, providing, you know, Ghana being the food basket for Nigeria, Nigeria being the manufacturing basket for West Africa. Yeah. yeah. And, and that that I think is the opportunity which is entirely within our control except for capital. But more importantly, it's something that we can do, and hopefully we can bring Norwegian companies and North uh, and, 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 and Northern European countries along for the ride. But it's our ride, not theirs. Thank you. OK, Jens, you're up next. Your final thought in one minute, Jens. Yes, um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to go back to, to sort of the ecosystem concept here. And uh, there is an, a dire need for infrastructure and, and uh improvements on free trade across Africa for and between Africa and other other continents. And I think the um, Caroline makes a really great point that if you take the bigger picture here when it comes to Mother Earth, whether that is climate change, SDGs, people coming out of poverty, um, Africa's population is looking to double over the next 30 years. That is there's nothing that we can do to change that. That is a population that needs to be to be fed. And whether that is jobs in manufacturing or uh, call centers, it doesn't matter, but we need to create uh, a meaningful and sustainable level of of a uh, wealth for, for for that population and i think that comes down to the bottlenecking um, uh, infrastructure uh, infrastructure is not coming out of transformational pace we are just patching up things as we go we're building one new power plant here and there every year but it is not really sort of fixing the, the bigger issue and i think in order to do that i think we got to do deal with what we can solve and that is these ecosystems which i very much subscribe to where we have a universe we have a, a cluster of, of companies and and, and governments that can work together and make something happen. Maybe we get a cascade effect out of that. But thank you very much for thank you, hosting Jens. me. Uh, now, Carolina, you have the honor of the last word. Uh, well, I totally agree with Somalia. Work for all is crucial. But my point is that uh, we cannot, Africa cannot follow kind of develop in the same way as Europe, uh, America, because that has failed. Uh, what uh, Africa has to do is to kind of leapfrog what we've done and focus on, for instance, like somebody like all of you mentioned, solar energy, alternative energy. And I think that can be, um, uh, that can help uh, to uh, give people work and to make business locally. So um, yeah, who failed was uh, Europe and uh, America. And I think that Africa can uh, at least be much more sustainable than we are and still have jobs. To Syntac, Carolina. So you've heard the two sides. The votes have been coming in and we have a winner. Let's find out who has won the AFC Great Debate. And gentlemen, the winner of the AFC Great Debate. And remember, the motion was this house believes infrastructure bottlenecks are the biggest barrier for Africa to take advantage of the great global supply chain realignment. We have a winner, and the winner is for the motion. For the motion, congratulations. For the motion wins. Team captain Samaila, you have the last word.
Thank you very much. Uh, again, um, we're, we're very pleased with the outcome of this uh, because we believe it fits into our purpose. Our purpose is to provide pragmatic solutions to Africa's uh, growing infrastructure deficit and challenging operating environment by developing and financing infrastructure, natural resource and uh, industrial assets that enhance the productivity and economic growth of African states. And we have done that. We have case studies that we've proved that this can be done. Uh, we have a good track record of de-risking uh, opportunities and deploying capital on the continent. We have deployed up to $8 billion since mm -hmm. our creation and we can do so much more. Um, we, we are very keen to see how we can reduce the cost of capital on the continent and we're having those conversations and we hope that we can get some help from uh, now fund the Norwegian uh, uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Uh, we can Talk it's a to, partnership. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a collaboration. Partnership. Yes, uh, and, and we're, we're happy to continue to partner with, with, with the Nordic region to see how we can um, change and confront the reality of risk as opposed to the perception of risk on the continent. Beautiful, and I'm happy that you guys came with your A game. Thank you very much for some great debaters. I know that I enjoyed it. I hope that you enjoyed it too. That was the AFC Great Debate. Now back to the main program. Thank you. Goodbye.